Hi, my name is Roger Kibbe, and I'm the Bixby Developer Evangelist. And today we're going to be talking about an intermediate Bixby tutorial. We're going to be talking about modeling and JavaScript. So let's jump right in. So as a reminder of the resources for Bixby, one, the Bixby homepage, bixbydevelopers.com. That's where you can get all the information, download uh, the IDE, and get information, more information about Bixby. Um, our GitHub repo is at uh, github.com Bixby developers. And today I'm going to be going over several code examples that are on that GitHub repo. So definitely pay attention to that and download those examples if you like. And finally, our Bixby tutorial videos. The first tutorial video of Bixby 101 is up on the Samsung Developer Newsroom. Uh, and I have the URL there for that. OK, so the agenda today, we're going to talk about concept modeling, action modeling, endpoints, JavaScript actions, properties and secrets, and library capsules. So jumping right in and talking about concept modeling, first thing I want to talk about is enumerations. And enumerations are how you constrain a concept to list of possible values. And so if you look at this sample code I have on the right, um, I have an enumeration set up for the month. So month, January, February, March, April. And that means if we're going to use this concept, the inputs would be limited to months of the year. Um, oftentimes, when you're using enumerations, you also using, use what we call vocabulary. Vocabulary is how you set up synonyms. So if you look at that code snippet on the bottom right, I mean, you can see I can set up synonyms. So I've set up January, Jan, February, Feb, March, March, et cetera. And what I'm really doing there is setting up the ability for the user to, to say a synonym. So if I said January, Bixby would interpret that as January. Or if I said Feb, Bixby would inter interpret that as February. Um, one note, so if you're using your enum in natural language, it's absolutely required that you create vocabulary. So if you're using it in training, your, your concept, your concept, which is an enum in natural language, then you'll need to set up um, vocabulary. You can just set it up one for one. So if I was going to use this uh, enum uh, in training myself, I could just have January, January, February, February, et cetera, uh, to enable training. To give you a second example of concept modeling and vocabulary, here I have uh, vocabulary for movie genres, so action, adventure, animation, et cetera. And as you can see, for instance, if I said cartoon, Bixby would interpret that as animation. Or if I said funny, Bixby would interpret that as comedy. So this is a really powerful thing that allows the user to speak in a natural way and then allows to Bixby to resolve that to particular input so you can understand that in your code. Um, let's talk about extends. So this is really from the OO extends model. Really, so you have a base structure here. This base structure, it's an animal structure, and it has this property of name. Um, and then I'm extending it here. And you can see I'm extending it. It's bird, extends animal, and I add this property can fly. So just like an OO, extends, extends it, and then you can add behavior to that. So kind of the sister to that, but different, is roll of. And what role of is creates an instance of. And the best way to explain that is look at my example right here. So I have this enumeration of cities. They're California cities, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, et cetera. Um, and I'm building a travel capsule. So I want a concept that's my departure city and I want a concept that's my arrival city. And so the possible departure cities and the possible arrival cities are the exact same set. So how do I do that in Bixby? So first, I, I've created this base enum of city with all the California cities. And then you see my departure city takes a role of city. And my arrival city takes a role of city. So that lets the departure city use that enum from the base city enum. And the arrival city enum take that from the base city enum as well. So training with role of. So there's a couple special things you need to do if you're using training for natural language with role of. Um, so first of all, let me look, look at this code example on the left. So I have this base hand enum. Um, in this case, just a sample symbol test. And then I'm using roll of for this user hand um, there. So how would I set this up if I wanted to actually use that in training? So looking over on the right side of the screen, you can see that I set the value node in training 
to that base concept. So the value node is set to base hand and a form test. Um, when you're using an enum and training, Bixby will automatically fill in that form with whatever uh, training phrase you used. But I need to use, because I use role of, because what the input that I really want is user hand, um, I need to set this role. So if you look over there on the bottom right, I've set the role to user hand. So the value node is base hand, but the role node is user hand. And this is really critical uh, when you're building training with role of, otherwise it won't work. So just something to remember. So let's talk about action modeling and cardinality. So in my example here, I have this action find capital uh, and I'm collecting a state. And if you can see down below, you see it says min required and max one, and that's the cardinality. And what min required means is I need um, at least one and max means one. So in this case, I want one state as input. I also can have the min be optional, which means zero is valid. And I can have the max be many. So that would mean uh, as many as I want. So if I put this, uh, for instance, min optional and max many, zero to as many as I want would be possible. And that's how you set cardinality for your input. So what happens if I've set my cardinality, I have something's optional, but I'd really like Bixby to elicit from the user that input. Um, so in this example I have over here in the right name, I have this, I'm inputting and grabbing the first name and notice I have min optional and max one. If I just ran that that way, Bixby would never, never elicit that input. But I want Bixby to elicit that input, but accept no value as, as a valid input. So look at this thing, prompt behavior always selection. And what that tells Bixby is, even though this is set with a cardinality of min optional, always go and ask the user, what is the first name? And when the user asks what's the, when you ask the user what the first name, they can enter a first name or they can enter nothing. Um, and that's totally valid for Bixby. So this is how you elicit an optional input um, from the user. So let me talk about action modeling and input groups. Um, and this is a way to take that concept of cardinality and spread it across multiple concepts that you're collecting in your action. So if you look at my example, find person, um, and you look down there, you see this input group, I just called it name. And then I call it requires one or more of, let me get back to that. And I'm collecting a first name and a last name. And what the one or more of tells Bixby is, hey, it's valid for the user just to input first name or last name or first and last name. And so there's several different options with requires. We saw one or more of, one of, says so exactly one of these concepts. One or more of, we just saw an example of that, zero or one of, um, zero or one or more, and zero or more of, so zero or more. So really, back to this is, if you have multiple inputs and you want that cardinality to apply to across those inputs, then use, use an input group. Talking about input validation. Um, so I'm using, re you can do within an action, you can do very simple input validation. If you look at my example here, um, I'm inputting a number um, and you see that validate and then an if statement. So validate and I say if number is less than one or greater than five, then prompt, please enter number between one and five. So what this is saying is the user must enter a number between one or five or they're gonna get a reprompt and, and Bixby will say, please enter a number between one and five. This is how you can do very simple input validation right in an action. Um, if you wanna do some more complicated input validation, then you definitely wanna to move to JavaScript and try it there. Let's talk about uh, error handling and what we do there. Um, so let me just look at, the, let's look at the example code and then I'll go back and explain what it does. So on the bottom here, you have this JavaScript function echo number uh, and a little bit of logic, modulus two. I'm just checking if the number is an even number or not. Um, and if the number isn't even, then I'm saying throw fail checked error, this number not even error. So how do I handle that? If we look at on the right hand side, there's the action that accompanies that JavaScript. And looking near the bottom, you say that throws and that error, number not even error. And what I'm doing here, uh, this on catch and replan is saying, hey, reprompt the user for an even number. So please enter an even number. So if I entered or said five here to Bixby, 
Big three would go execute this JavaScript. The JavaScript would say, hey, five's not an even number. And it would reprompt the user and say, please enter an even number. Um, and one thing to note, um, we'll talk about HTTP calls later. But the HTTP errors are handled the exact same way, and you do that in, in your action. Um, we have a lot of examples of this on GitHub, and at the bottom of the screen here, I have a link to the GitHub examples uh, for error handling. Default values. Um, if you want to set a default value for a concept, um, here I have an example. Once again, I'm using number, my favorite. Uh, and if you look at that called default init, and I'm just setting it to number four. So what Bixby would do here is uh, it would go through that, and the default value for this uh, concept would be four. Now, let's say that's great. I want to tell the user the default value of four, but let them edit it. Maybe they want to say five or six or seven. Um, once that, look at that. I use that prompt behavior, always selection. So if you remember previously, whenever I say always selection, it forces Bixby to elicit that input from the user. In this case, it'll elicit the input, but it'll show the user or tell the user that four has already been set as the default value. Um, instantiation strategy. So the use case here is I have a color um, that I want the user to choose, but I want to limit it to red, green, or blue. And when Bixby asks the user for what's the color, I want it to give a menu item, say red, green, or blue, and have the user select one of those or say one of those. Um, and what, how do I set that up? I create what's called an instantiation strategy. Um, so you see the ID, that match pattern. We're going to talk about those a little bit later. And then that strategy intent, and I'm just setting these, these values, red, green, and blue, um, and the goal is color. So this is a way that you constrain the input that Bixby will elicit from a user. Um, it's also useful for getting smart defaults for location, currency, and other values. Um, if you look at the documentation, there's a lot of really good examples of where instantiation strategy is a great way to save yourself some code and do things in a little simpler way. Let's talk about endpoints. So we finished talking about modeling, and now I want to start talking about JavaScript. And if you remember, endpoints are how I take that concepts and actions and tie them to my JavaScript business logic. And there's two options with endpoints, um, local and remote. Um, when you do a remote endpoint, that means the endpoint is not hosted actually in that Bixby capsule. But you have a remote API and you want to make that call. Um, you can set the parameters. You can set authorization, HTTP methods, uh, get, put, et cetera. And you also set up the headers. But the challenge with remote endpoints is the return values must map to that return concept that you're returning from, from, from this remote API call. And so it's pretty constrained there. So very typically, um, unless you know it'll map, the JSON will map exactly to that return concept. Um, when you're calling a remote API, you'll actually use a local endpoint. And then in your JavaScript, you can call that remote API. And then you can do that mapping back to that concept that you're going to return uh, to show to the user or have spoken to the user. So let's see how you do that. Um, so in JavaScript, and I'm going to show some examples with REST, um, and we're using the HTTP, HTTP object um, there. Um, it supports get, post, delete, and put. Um, if you're familiar with traditional JavaScript, um, when you make a remote call, you need to set up a promise or a callback um, because it's asynchronous. But that's built into the Bixby HTTP, HTTP object. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing that. It just does it for you. Um, you set up three parameters, um, the URL, um, options for get. This is where you set up your query parameters. Um, and for post, delete, and put, there's a parameters uh, params parameter. Uh, and that's where you put the body of your request. So let's look at the example code to illustrate this. So really simple things. I'm setting an ID and location variable. Um, and then I'm getting this URL. There's the, uh, the URL. Um, format is JSON. And that query, I'm setting location and ID. And if you look below there, you can see this forms on that URL and makes that API call that way. I will say SOAP is also supported. Um, see the documentation of you using SOAP. 
Um, and we have a bunch of example code here on how to do this on GitHub, not only gets, but posts and puts, et cetera, there. So definitely check out GitHub um, when you're using REST API calls to understand better how to do it. Okay, let's talk about viv context. So this is a really useful variable that you can pass into your JavaScript functions. And from viv context, you can get user data like locale, time format, device information, permissions, et cetera. Um, and I have a little example here. So I have this endpoint get number. And you can see I'm passing in a number and viv context to this echo number.js. And at the bottom there, I have echo number.js, a little snippet of that code. Um, you can see I'm passing in viv context to that JavaScript function um, and then just logging the user locale there. Um, and we actually have some example code on GitHub on how to use viv context, and the link is down there at the bottom. So let's talk about capsule properties. And this is a way to store configuration for your capsule. Um, and I want to just jump right into the example because I think it explains itself. So look over on the right and the top, and you see capsule config mode equals default. Let me get back to that. And then I'm setting a couple things. I'm setting a uh, test value to one, two, three, and foo to A, B, C, D. But notice I start those with the config.default, and that last one I start with config.debug. But you notice that first line says default. And what that means is, with it set up this way, I'll read the default values. Um, but if I change it to debug, I'd read the debug values. So I have some sample code right below that, right? So I'm grabbing config.get test value, it outputs one, two, three, config get foo, it outputs A, B, C, D. If I change that mode to debug, config get foo would output X, Y, Z. Um, so this is a great place to store configuration for your capsule, but definitely don't want to store, you don't want to store sensitive data, API keys and passwords uh, in capsule.property. So where do I store those? In config and secrets. So like I said, API keys, passwords, anything sensitive that you don't want in your source code, you store here. Um, and this is in on BixbyDevelopers.com. In the Teams and Capsules section, when you open that up and you've uh, submitted a capsule, you can set up config and secrets. And I have a screen capture here. So you can set up configuration, that's name value pairs. And you can set up secrets, once again, name value pairs. Uh, in, in your JavaScript, if you want to get those values, um, config.get, just like capsule.properties, is where you get configuration data. But if you want to get secrets, it's secrets.get, uh, and that will get that secrets data. So this is the place where you store sensitive data that you don't want in your source code. Library capsules. I'm going to go over these really high level, kind of a basic overview. So these part of the built-in functionality, work with complex concepts, date, times, geography, et cetera. And really the whole idea here is we've pre-written a bunch of code for you so you don't have to write all this code. Um, to use them in your capsule.bxb report, you import them. So I have an import statement code snippet over here and I'm importing viv image um, as image. So when I say as image, that means it's alias as image, and then I can reference it by that image there, and there's a version number that goes along with it. Um, there's a lot of these. They're all uh, outlined in the documentation. I show some really common ones that are used here. Um, time, profile, geo, which is locations, money, currency, and prices, and our example, viv.images. So definitely, Become familiar with these because these can uh, save you from writing an awful lot of code because we've pre-written the code for you. And that's it. So thank you very much. My name's Roger Kibbe, and I'm a Bixby developer evangelist, and I have my Twitter handle, at Roger Kibbe, down below. I hope this helps you build an amazing, great capsule. I cannot wait to see uh, what you can build with this. I hope this tutorial was super helpful. Thanks. Goodbye.